What I would like to start with is all of the changes that have happened here at Daniel Wright. Our start time, end time of the day has changed. We have redone the entire bell schedule. Um, we have been fortunate enough to implement teaming at the seventh and eighth grade. So those of you that um, were part of, um, in sixth grade, your children were a part of teams. You now, we now have that opportunity. We're so thankful um, for our staff to be able to team in the seventh and eighth grade. Mr. Herring, can you turn off the front row lights here? Thank you. All right, so to get started, one of the things I want to talk to you about is another big change that has happened and is will be happening throughout the year here at Daniel Wright. And it's actually um, has to do with our grading practices and using and implementing grading practices that will improve our communication to you and the communication from teachers to students. And so I want to start by talking to you a little bit about why we even grade students. And what are report cards for? And remember that, you know, we all grew up in a system where, or we have been in systems where we have been given a grade, a number, and that number is then translated into a letter. And that letter, an A, a B, a C, a D, is supposed to indicate what it is we know and we're able to do relative to a specific content. So the reason why we give those grades is to communicate how your children are doing. And with the purpose of the report card is for you to get a summary of how they're doing in each of those content areas. However, the reality of our grading practices is that there are things that influence those grades that are not related to mastery or skill that there was a lot of things we have been including in calculation of a student grade that were related to behaviors. Things like completing homework, turning in work late, participating in class. So we have been reporting or including these behaviors in student grades. And what has been happening, or what can happen, is that you can get a distorted representation of what a child's curricular proficiency is because that grade includes not just achievement but also these other behaviors. And the grade that you're looking at may be inflated, it may be diluted. And it does not clearly communicate to you as a parent what it is your child is good at or what it is your child might need help with. I want to share with you here um, Ken O'Connor is um, an author, the author of the book um, How to Grade for Learning by Using 15, 15 Fixes to Broken Grades. Um, at the end of the PowerPoint, I'll put up some resources. He's really, a lot of his things you can find on YouTube, some little clips, um, but I'll put up resources. He is um, an author that has really pioneered the work around accurate grading, and I want to share this clip with you. So I believe that the essential question that we have to ask about grades and grading is this. How confident are you that the grades that students get in your schools, in your school districts, meet these four conditions? Because I believe that these are the conditions of quality for grades. For grades to be effective, they need to be consistent, accurate, meaningful, and supportive of learning. First of all, they need to be consistent. It shouldn't be a matter of chance whether a student is in Teacher X or Teacher Y's class. If they're achieving at the same level, they should get the same grade. And unfortunately, that often has not been the case because teachers have had very different ideas about what ingredients should go into grades, and they've had very different ideas about performance standards. And as a result, students who have been achieving at the same level have frequently got the same grades. And in any system, but especially in a standards-based system, I think we have to see that as being unacceptable. Secondly, grades need to be accurate. Very important decisions are made about and by students on the basis of grades. For those to be good decisions, they need to be based on accurate information. And of course, grades basically result from combining a whole lot of information, most commonly into a single symbol. 
Anytime we scrunch information in that way, there's a real danger that we lose accuracy. So we need to think about what contributes to accuracy. Uh, and so that's a second really important condition. Third, and somewhat similar but a little bit different is, are they meaningful? As much as is possible for a summary symbol, does it give information about students' achievement of learning goals? And fourth, and I believe most importantly, are they supportive of learning? Is what we are doing in the assessment and learning process making it obvious to everybody involved, students, parents, teachers, that the focus of what we're doing is on learning. That school, put a little tritely, is a learning game, not a grading game. And I think we will know when we have got somewhere with this, when we find we have students and parents coming to us and saying, not what can I do to improve my grade, but what can I do to improve my learning. And ultimately that's, I think, where we want to get to, and hopefully we'll get there fairly soon in a very general way. So what we started to think about was how confident are we that the grades that we are giving students, the grades that we're using to place students, make important decisions on placement, to provide enrichment for them, to provide remediation for them, how confident are we that those grades accurately reflect and clearly communicate what it is they know and they're able to do? And so after reflecting on that, we've decided that um, starting this school year, we're going to make some changes to our grading and our grading practices. I'm going to share them with you in the next 15 minutes. I'm going to go quite quickly through them, but please know that I'll share some resources for you. I'll be available at the end, um, and, and at any time available for conversation or a phone call. Um, I know it's a lot into 15 minutes, so I want to apologize up front for that. <laughs> All right, we're going to start off. So our first fix we're doing is it says we will not include student behaviors in grades. We will only include achievement. And things like participation, preparedness, um, are they timely with their homework? We are not going to calculate that, average it into a student's grade. I'm not saying that it's not important and those are things that are, um, those are things that are important for our learners to have as good habits and to make them better learners. So we do believe that these behaviors are very important to students being successful, but what we don't want to do is average information, numerical information about those behaviors into a student's grade. That grade should reflect what they know in the content. So again, it's not that we're not going to report on them, we're just not going to calculate them in. So what we will be doing this year is each quarter, teachers will be reporting on student behavior by completing a learner behavior characteristic rubric. And this is an example of what that rubric is going to look like. We're going to report on how your child is doing relative to participation, relative to preparedness. So we're going to share that information with you so we can intervene or we can support where necessary. We're just not going to calculate it into the grade. Secondly, we will not punitively reduce marks on work submitted late. And the key here is punitively. You know, in the past, some teachers may have said, well, every day, every day is late, it's a letter grade less. Or, sorry, if you can get it to me tomorrow, but the best you can get on that is a 50%. That's punitive. That is not teaching that child to value that particular activity. And so we don't want to punish kids for being right. We do want to, we may take some points off that are instructive in nature, but we really want to focus on the why was that late and how can we support them? Do they need help with um, executive functioning and organizing? Or was there something significant that happened in their home the, the night before that we need to know about? So rather than punishing kids, we want to support them. Number three, we will not give points for extra credit or use bonus points. 
we will only include evidence relative to curricular learning. So no, you can't bring in a box of tissues and get five bonus points. Right? Um, or if you bring that page back signed by your parent, you'll get three extra credit points. We're not going to do that anymore because that just dilutes the grade. That doesn't tell us what a child knows relative to content. So, what we will do is we can offer extensions that are curricular based, that provide us with more information on what kids know. So, there might be bonus activities, but they are going to be curricularly related. Four. We will not punish academic dishonesty with reduced grades. Things like cheating, plagiarizing, not saying that those are good to do. What I am saying is that the consequence will not be a zero. And I think a lot of us may have come from a system, you know, an education system that you cheat, you get a zero. <laughs> well, for us, um, there will be a consequence. There is a consequence for that behavior. The behavior is not okay. That consequence might be community service. That consequence might be after school detention. But because we believe that the assignments and assessments we give kids to do are valuable and provide us with important information on what they need to know, we will require that child to redo that activity because it's going to give us information on what they know. We will not consider attendance um, in grade determinations. Of course, we're not going to average that in. We're going to report on it. However, um, we're at, we will not punish kids from it, but we will support and intervene when necessary. Number six, we will not include zeros when evidence is missing or as a punishment. Now, the thing about zeros is zeros give a numerical value to something that was never assessed. Because let's think about our current grading system. We use numbers to communicate a level of proficiency. So if a student gives us nothing, Putting a zero in is kind of counterintuitive because the zero is to indicate zero level of proficiency on that content, but you have nothing to assess. So a zero gives a numerical value to something that you've never seen. Also, zeros actually allow students to escape accountability for learning. We tend to think that if we give them a zero, that'll teach them Right? And it doesn't. And I'm going to tell you, after 18 years myself in the classroom, I can list off the name of kids that I visually can see in my head that had zero and zero and zero and zero and just kept getting the zero. Because you know what? No one's bothering me about it. I'm just getting a zero. I'm not getting it done. Well, that's not going to happen. Um, we, are, we need to be able to collect evidence on how kids are doing and progressing in the curriculum. A failing grade. Now, there are some times that a failing grade gives us information. It tells us this child has not shown growth towards this particular standard. So I'm not saying there will never be failing grades. However, we're going to enter it in as a 50 rather than a zero. So it doesn't have, and the key here is a disproportionate effect on the grade. Let me show you quickly what I mean by that. When we're talking about converting zeros to 50s, we're referring to zeros earned on major projects and assessments, not homework. So don't think you'll never ever see a zero. Because remember, our system that we use, our software, you know, we, we put zeros in to indicate something. So you, it's not that you will never see a zero, but you will not see a zero on a major assessment that is on a 100 point scale. Now the reason why is this. Here is Daniel Wright's grade scale. And you can see that you have from 90 to 100, you have 10 opportunities to get an A. 
You have from 80 to 89, you have actually 11 opportunities to get A. You have 10 opportunities to get a B. You have 10 opportunities to get a C of varying degrees. And look at us. Aren't we doing the best thing for kids? Because look what we're doing is we're giving them 60 opportunities to fail. We would never, this scale would never be inverted, would we? Right? We would never say, well, you have 60 opportunities to get an A. Of course we wouldn't. But yet it's okay that we give them 60 opportunities to fail. And all that does is sink kids. It puts them in a situation that they cannot get out of. So let's talk about something that's not motivating to students. Take a look at this. Here are scores on a 100 point scale. Let's say a student got a 95, got an 85 on another assessment, maybe has a sick parent at home, things are getting tough. As the year goes on or the quarter goes on, they're really struggling with keeping up. Grades are going down. They finally bottom out with a zero. But, and their overall average is a 64. Because we put that zero in there, there's no recouping that. Even if they got 100% on all the major assessments, they're not going to go above a C. And that doesn't seem fair, does it? How can you get 100% of everything and you've tanked one thing and you're now considered not proficient? So what we're talking about is saying, okay, if we're going to do that, we're not going to give anything below a 50. So yes, the failure will still be in there, but not to a point that is so unmotivating to a student that they're, because they're in a hole they can't get out of. We also will start looking at implementing more five or four point scales because when you have a, a zero in a smaller scale, it doesn't put that undue influence on the overall grade. And lastly, we will allow students to redo assessments. If we do not allow students to redo work, right, we're suggesting that it wasn't important for them to do it in the first place. You know, a student comes in, says, I don't have it done. We say, okay. Right? And that's insinuating that that wasn't even an assignment that was important for them to do. However, prior to students redoing something like a major assessment, they have to demonstrate some relearning. For example, your son or daughter cannot miss four homeworks, take a test, tank it, and then come back and say, when are we taken? And do nothing to prepare or learn to, to be retested. They will have to go back and do assignments that the teacher would say, okay, hey, this is what you have to practice, because yes, you can retake it, but clearly you didn't do enough practice the first time. So, the students must do some relearning before reassessing. I also will tell you that as you're meeting with the teachers and you're working with the teams throughout the year, they will be sharing with you the reduce and retake policies. Um, and that they have to be within reasons and the teachers will decide. So I, I would really want you to make sure that you don't leave here today saying everything can be redone. You know, teachers are gonna make the decisions. You know, this is something that's very integral in deciding where a child is in the learning. This is definitely something they can retake. There might be something else that they'll say, you know what, you don't need to redo this at this time because I might be getting to it again. It's going to spiral. For lots of our curriculums, we have spiraling skills through there. So that teacher may say, you know what, not important to focus right now on the retake because I know, you know, two weeks, three weeks from now, we're going to be working on that skill again, so let's use that time for you to practice. So the bottom line is this. Going back to what Ken O'Connor said, at Daniel Wright, we want to be confident that the grades students receive and the procedures we use are number one supportive of learning. We're not in the business of sinking kids. Number two, they're accurate. That we're giving you as a parent clear information what it is your child knows and is able to do 
and we're using clear and accurate information to make curricular decisions on your child. We want them to be meaningful. You want to be able to look at the grade and it makes sense and share some information with you. And we also want it to be consistent. We don't want you to be have one child in Mr. Jones' class and another child in Mrs. Littlefair's class. And because they grade differently, whose child may have the same level of achievement, but their grades are disparate. We want to make sure that we have consistency in grading. So it doesn't matter what class or what teacher your child has, that they're all being graded accurately and supporting their learning. Some resources, and I just, you know, I will be posting this. We've videotaped it as well as I'll be posting the PowerPoint on the D103 website so that you can go back and get, have these rest, um, resources. Uh, a Repair Kit for Grading by Ken O'Connor, and also the work of author Rick um, Warmly, and he will actually be joining us here in the district. We have just really have been very fortunate to get him to come in November to work with our teachers. We're very excited about that, but two authors and individuals that have a lot of information on what I talked about tonight. And lastly, um, if you have any specific questions that I can't answer or um, you want to talk more about, our Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum Instruction, Andy Reynolds, is also, her information is up there for you to be able to speak.